what's going on everybody this is black men sunday so i'm your host Corey sylvester murray we're talking about generational wealth mental health finance and business it's a black man sunday time to put all childish things away i refuse to be the man i was yesterday gotta put my best foot forward in elevate and today we're talking to the sergeant Sergeant Roy Lewis, this brother is a retired Army combat veteran with over 36 years of service. This brother also is a trainer. This brother is a trainer as a drill instructor. This brother also is executed. He's executed special operation missions in Iraq. He's also the 2017 graduate United States Sergeant Major Academy in El Paso, Texas. His brother's also a major fitness trainer and personal life coach in Charlotte, North Carolina. He's also the author of Broken Things, a Christian motivational book about managing personal brokenness. You know, I kind of read that as two ways. Brokenness, like broke, is in broke, is a financial broke or brokenness is in my heart. So we're going to talk about all that. This brother's also a feature speaker at colleges as the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and Tuskegee University. So without further ado, Sergeant Roy Lewis, welcome to Black Men Sundays, brother. How you doing? Thank you, Corey. Thank you for the invitation. I am so glad to be here. Definitely, man. Yeah, that intro took a little bit. I had to warm it up. Like, <laughs> oh, man, I had, to, I had to get my syllables in order with that. But, you know, let's go on and start this conversation, man, because, you know, when I'm looking at you, first off, you're the author of, of Broken Things, a Christian mm -hmm. motivational book. Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, that book, uh, actually, it, it, I started it out as a as a project. I got uh, called up in 20, uh, 2007 to go to Iraq uh, to be on a special ops team. So I decided to, uh, anybody would tell you that has ever been overseas, has gone to a combat zone, it's just, it gets very, you know, life is just kind of, you don't get any days off. Everybody works seven days a week. And that's actually a good thing because it's like you can get very bored very, very easy. People get homesick. People do, when people get homesick and sad, they do dumb stuff. So I decided to to write. And the inspiration for Broken Things came about where, uh, of course, I'm a Christian. It's my Christian faith. But um, I took three personal stories where uh, there were some events that were kind of catastrophic uh, to me and um, really shook my faith, you know, really tested my faith. Uh, one was uh, where... Uh, my when I was over uh, over in Iraq, my son got arrested, and I I could share that story at another time. And then my daughter had a rare form of epilepsy. She stopped at 16 years old. She stopped talking. And then of course the third the third event was when I was actual uh, combat over in Iraq, and uh, you know all three of those events really, if you're a believer, it really tests your faith. It really tests you. If you really believe in God, you know, God shows up and he did in those moments of where if if he didn't show up, I would have probably lost it all. Yeah, let's talk about it, because in the book, um, you talk about uh, managing personal brokenness. Yeah. And like I said, what the way I took it before I knew what you just told me, I took it as brokenness as in from a financial point of view. But then I also thought about heart brokenness. Yeah. Well, you're you're right, and and brokenness for me is just um, it's it's that place, and I believe everybody gets there. Everybody goes to that place where uh, they have moments in their life where extreme discouragement. There's times where you just feel like you're going to give up, and and the question is, what what do you do when you get to those places? Where do you those those are the dark places, uh, and sometimes those dark places are so scary because we have. You know, even celebrities we know of that have gotten to that dark place and they just decided to cash in or to escape some kind of way. But for the for the Christian believer, we have our faith, you know, and we have the promise of of the Lord Jesus Christ that he will be with us. You know, I, I love the 23rd Psalm when he says, though I walk through the valley of shallow of death, I will fear no evil. I'm with you always. So that's a promise. It's not a promise that bad things will not happen. But it's a promise that when you go through it, you can trust me that I will bring you through it. And, and another uh, scripture I love is that uh, I used to tell my children this when they got ready to go to school. as uh, a scripture that says that uh, each day God has given us everything we need to get through that particular day. So if you're going to have a flat tire, you're going to be God's going to put things in your toolbox to get through whatever 
you're dealing with for that day. You may have a bad day at work. You may have a bad day, uh, maybe family situation. You're going to be okay. You know, it's going to be uncomfortable, but you're going to be okay. And and I equate it almost to almost fitness. Like if if uh, if anybody's ever lift weights before, you know, when you train to lift weights, you don't lift. It takes a while to lift weights. So the first part of lifting weights is that you got to go through that process where you got to put the muscles under stress. You know, that's the only way they're going to grow. Uh, those muscle fibers need to be torn and ripped and 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 manipulated in a way, and it hurts and it's uncomfortable. Uh, but I've seen it with my clients. I crack up laughing because my clients, especially my females, when I train them, the first if I can get my clients through the first two weeks, I'm good to go. But those those first two initial weeks, they're like, oh, my arms hurt. I don't want to do this. Oh, it hurts. I, I I don't feel like it. And I, my job is to coach them to get through that. And as they get through that, all of a sudden, after like the second week, the muscles start getting stronger. They start looking a little cut, start getting a little bit more competent, a little bit more cardiovascular endurance. And I start cracking them laughing. I always play devil's advocate. I say, well, wait a second. I thought you wanted to quit. And they're like, oh, no, no, I feel great. I feel great. So that that's how it is with our faith. You know, God allows these. Uh, and again, God allows these things, uh, not that he allows bad things to happen to us, but what you know, whatever our life throws our way, we're, we're victorious. You know, the the Christian faith, we're the only people that talk the way we do. Great information, man. And let's let's take it back a little bit, though. You know, um, as I said, you know, I mean, you train new recruits as a drill instructor at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. You also uh, retired Army combat veteran, and you've also executed special operations missions in Iraq. So let's take it back real quick. Okay. What was your driving force to get in the military, and then, you know, as far as generational wealth, that's what our show is about. As far as generational wealth, what advice can you provide for that? Because we hear brothers say, okay, stock market, crypto, we mm -hmm. hear the home ownership, we hear multiple homes, we hear mm -hmm. commercial businesses, we're hearing all the flavors. So I just want to know from your point of view, you know, what can you provide us with? Let's go. For me, uh, before I joined the military, which was in 1982, uh, I did two years of college. I did two years of college. I actually started out in music. I was a music major. And I wanted to, you know, do music and theater. And I was all into that. And uh, this is before you had American Idol and The Voice, all this stuff, uh, before you had technology. You know, back in the day, anybody old timer would tell you back in the day, you had to go and audition. You had to show up with your game face on to, to be able to get picked up for uh, a music job or show or anything. Not like it is today. But I did that for a couple of years. And then uh, I was in New York. I'm from originally from New York. So uh, when I graduated college, I went to New York City, tried to do my thing. And um, after about two years, I'm like, man, you know. Uh, you can't have a car. You can't have a wife, which I did. I have a car and I married my college sweetheart. And anybody tell you in show business, you it's like before you make it, you're dirt, you're dirt poor. Let's put it that way. You don't have any money. You're just broke. So I remember telling my wife, I said, let me go down to the recruiter's office and check this army thing. out. I'm not really sure. That's the last thing I remember. Next, you know, I was on a bus bound for Fort Dix, New Jersey. That's all I remember. I was on a bus. Uh, the rest is history. I, I, I've never been that scared in my life. And I thought I made the worst decision, Corey, in my life of joining the military, not knowing I made the best decision. Uh, it gave me, uh, by joining the military, it gave me skill sets, gave me things that I I, I didn't have uh, before I joined the Army. So I got my computer technology training and everything from the military. Uh, I only stayed in the active, I stayed in the active side of the Army for three years before I got out. Uh, so that and when I got out, I had skills. It also gave me knowledge of money. What is money? I realized that money on three different levels for poor people, money is just about is used to pay bills. That's it, just to pay bills. Uh, for the middle class, money is used for just being able to get uh, like credit and buy things of to spend money you don't have. That's what I learned. And then also I learned with, I started realizing that I started looking at people who are doing well. And when I was in the military, I saw a lot of minorities doing well, uh, bringing in wealth. And I'm figuring, I'm asking questions. And that's what I've always taught my children. Ask questions. What do these people do to get the kind of wealth, to generate the kind of wealth that they do? And one thing I learned that asking, uh, asking people that question is that 
money to people at the higher level is to take that money and to do something with it. It's almost a biblical uh, principle that uh, in the Bible talks about the sower and the seed. I don't know if you're familiar with that parable. Jesus taught that story that there were uh, three individuals. He they gave he gave uh, the the owner gave them uh, seed and one buried it in the ground. Uh, one took two and got four, one took five and got 10, you know, but it was that person that took it and buried it in the ground. And when the master asked him, why did you do that? He said, oh, I was afraid. I was, your heart, you know, I was afraid. So I just took it and buried it in the ground. So that's how I learned about those different stages of how people use money or people use it to pay bills. And I, and the thing is about as old as I am, I've been at all three of those levels. It's amazing. Cause when I was poor, me and my wife, I was just, we were sitting on the back porch last night and we were counting our blessings and we were laughing because there was a moment in our lives, Corey, we couldn't even save 20 bucks. We were living from paycheck to paycheck and it was, it was miserable. I hated it. I mean, I got my paycheck, everything went out to bills and everything. And if, if the car needed a tire or something would just unexpectedly would pop up, we did, you know, it threw the whole thing off. Then we got a little bit better. We started getting better with our money. Uh, I have to admit, to my embarrassment, I got really into credit. I started. I had. I had three visas, four Mastercards. I had a American Express. I was the credit king, Corey. It was so. I was so bad with credit that I went to a, a credit uh, advisor company, and I I took all my credit cards and I showed the guy. He, and the guy said, "Well, how are you making all these payments with these credit cards?" And I showed him my little technique of how I you know, Rob from Paul to pay Peter. And he says, he, if he says, oh my gosh, he said, this is pretty good. I thought you were selling drugs. I got so good at it that I was uh, good at moving money around, but I was broke. Even though I had all this credit, I was broke. Then eventually, as I, after I got out of that, I went bankrupt too. And I learned the lesson because I went on a cash by cash basis. So now I'm forced to live on a cash by cash basis. So the money that I would earn I paid bills, but then I started taking that money and putting it in places where it would grow. I started my own business. My only regret, Corey, is that if I had the chance to go back to do it again, I would start my own business because I didn't know all the tax breaks and everything that were associated with owning a business. And like I have a, my son-in-law, my, my baby girl's husband, he is a owner of a martial arts academy in Oklahoma City. He owns one, not two, but three academies. In Oklahoma City, and he's killing it. And he goes on vacation when he wants. Uh, yeah, he earns his money, but he calls the shots. And with my personal training business, uh, I just recently um, that I have, I when I file my taxes, I'm like, I don't own the government nothing. I don't own them nothing because I was like, oh my gosh, I wish somebody would told me this when I was in my 20s. But that's how I learned how now I realize with money, money is a tool. It's not something for me just to go get, you know, six pack of beer and pizza on the weekend. My money goes to work for me. I know that's kind of a long answer, but no, that's, that's perfect. No, I'm not. It's yeah. perfect. And let's talk about some of these because, you know, it's a lot of entrepreneurs listen to this show. It's a lot of business owners. I'm a business owner that, on this show mm -hmm. as well. So let's talk about some of these tax breaks that a lot of business owners may not realize that are afforded to them. Well, one of the things that I know, like, especially in the African-American culture, uh, with all due respect to my dad, my dad's a country boy from Alabama, you know, and I grew up, I'm a third generation uh, child. My great, great, great grandfather was Rufus Robinson, a sharecropper from Alabama. And, um, but I, my dad for a lot of years, I, I mean, he's one of my heroes because he never finished school. But he was such a hard worker, very, very hard worker. And he made sure that, you know, that I would go to college and educate myself. But one of the things that uh, him and I've had this discussion because we were at at different ends because my dad, they're from the generation. They're just taught to get a job. You get a job, you work it for 30 years and hopefully enough you get a pension. You know, well, that's changed a lot, you know, because I, you know, we're not taught to start businesses. We're not taught to in the African American culture. We're not taught to uh, to start create, starting investing. I've never heard those words until I got way out of college. And then when I met a minority businessman, I, I remember looking at this person like he came from another planet. I was just like I didn't know that existed. 
Now, I'm a little bit older than you guys, but the, when I saw a well-to-do minority person, they were either an athlete or a singer. That was it. But when I met uh, a minority that was a business that had a, he or she had her own business uh, or they were investing, I was like, I didn't know we could do that. Nobody never told me that. So as uh, nowadays, I'm uh, now I, when I get a chance to speak, especially to young people, I say, what is it that you want to do? And then they look at me with this puzzle look and I said, okay, I'll make it easier for you. I remember my eight year old son asked me a question one time. He was eight years old. And I, it blew me out of the water. He said, dad, what's the difference between a job and a career? And I was like, hmm. I, and I could, only thing I could think of is like, it's all how you wake up in the morning because you got to find out who are you, what you want to do. You got to find that one thing. And I think the people that that have their careers and 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 the real smart about making the, the proper decisions are the ones know that they want what they want to do and they go after it and they'll do it whether they do it for free they don't care about the hours they don't care who they have to talk about and in my opinion I've learned over the years those people that I've met that think that way are the most happiest people that I've ever met you know and I went the route uh, you know, I went to route. I I, re I retired two years ago from the military, but I also retired from corporate world. I used to work for Bank of America, and uh, I was a software test engineer for Bank of America. And now with this new knowledge, I'm like, if I had to stay there for another 10, 20 years, I I would have I would have been prison. I, I'm not a corporate guy. Now what I know now, I I can't do that. But now having tasted having running my own business and and. And it's it's so rewarding when I sit down and start at my computer and I start uh, making contacts and making business plans and stuff. It excites me because it's mine. Yeah, I take ownership of it. So when it fails, it's all on me. It, you know, there's nobody else. It's all on me. And that's a good feeling. That, that That's where I, I want to pass it on to the next generation of kids. I'm working at this high school, volunteering at this high school now. And I'm telling these high schoolers now. Hey, figure out who, what, who, and what you want to do. And I, and one thing I put them at rest, I said, listen, nobody gets you. They don't get you. They're not supposed to get you. You have to get you. You have to figure out what you want to do. And then the next thing, once you figure out what you want to do, go talk to people. I, I gave them some strategy. I said, go talk to people that are doing the things that you want to do. And I guarantee you, they will talk your ear off. You know, uh, when I see, when I, uh, as, as I went through my life, I talked to these successful minorities. I'm like, how did you, how did you take this income and generate more income? What did you do? And they, oh, they just shared. It was better than college. It was just much better than college. And they sat there, hey, go here, talk to this person, read these books. This is what you have to do. They didn't give it to me. They didn't, in other words, like I wanted a fish. They didn't give me a fish. They taught me how to fish. So it was all, it was all good new business owners that say, okay, I have a business I've invested, but I'm still trying to figure out my business plan. I know what I'm selling, but I'm just struggling with a business plan. So what advice would you give? My advice would be is that a lot of times when I hear that conversation come up, my, my next question is what, tell me, what are you doing? What, what, what are the steps that you're doing now? And usually the response I get is either they are, they're just kind of like not talking to the right people. Um, Cause sometimes when you, when you're, you're in this, I, I try to make them realize you're in a, in a place where it's very few go there. So you can't take your uncle, you can't take your cousin, you can't take the people that you, you know, that you love that are in your circle. You got to go outside that circle. You got to be in a place where you got to talk to different people. I just had to went to a, a, a men's uh, breakfast this Saturday and I talked to this gentleman who had owns nine houses in Richmond, uh, not in Richmond, but in Virginia, Newport News uh, on the shoreline in Richmond, nine houses, million dollar properties that he owns. And I sat there after we got done, we sat in the parking lot for 20 minutes. I'm like, how did you do that? He sat there and told me how he got this real estate and he gave me his card and he gave me his phone number. There's so much free stuff out there. So when I hear people like, hey, I'm trying to start a business but I, I'm not, I don't understand my business plan uh, or is, I'm not, they're not getting the right information. And then the next question is, why aren't you getting the correct information? Where are you getting your information from? You have to always ask these questions. 
And and I think sometimes um, I sense sometimes it's fear because it's 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 all new, it's all different, and different and new is good. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's it's something because you know when you get to the point you think you know everything, you're setting yourself up for failure. You know you really are. So I don't consider to be the the subject matter expert of anything. I talk to people. Uh, about all the things that I that I'm interested in, you know, because they know, you know, they have a knowledge and it's all and they're willing to give it to you if you just ask for it. And then take that information, make a phone call, you know, get on a website, take take notes. Um, if something's not working, it and what is the word that young people use today? Networking. Always network. I go to meetings, I go on uh LinkedIn is a great site to link up with other people that are doing what you do. Uh, when you say, hey, I'm so-and-so, uh, would you mind explaining this to me about a business plan? Or how, maybe I'm not getting this right. And they will tell you exactly what you're doing for free. You just have to ask. Mm, but sometimes we can't, we can't get too prideful to think that we know everything. Because when we get to the point where we know everything, then you're setting yourself up for disaster. I'm sorry. That's the way it, that's the way it is. You know. But humility, to sit back and raise your hand and say, hey, and here and Corey, here's another thing I told my um, my students at, uh, at the high school on volunteering. I'm a software test engineer in technology. Guess what? I don't even have a, a computer science degree. And they looked at me like I was crazy. I said, I do not have a computer science degree. They said, how did you how did you achieve all that without the degree? I raised my hand. I asked questions. I got involved. I was around people that didn't look like me. that didn't sound like me. I humbled myself and I went to these individuals and said, show me, how do you do that? And they told me, it works. It really does work. So I say to new business owners out there, you know, God put that vision in your heart. You have that vision for that business. And and also be careful who you share that with. Because sometimes I've also learned too, is that you can get in a circle and share your vision and and I know you guys have ran into that too. They your friends, they mean well, family mean well, but they'll sit back and talk you down and tell you all the reasons why you can't do something. You know, so you got to be careful about who you share that vision with, you know, because it's important. Because when I'm the circles that I'm in, I'm around people that are going places. If I say, hey, I want to start a um, real estate company that caters to first time home buyers, I'm around people that think like that. And they'll start throwing out ideas as compared to people who, who don't have that that same vision. They're like, well, why do you want to do that? You know, I heard so-and-so did this and I heard so-and-so did that and they failed. And they lost a lot of money. That's going to just, that's going to smote out, you know, put out your, your vision. So you got to, and then also, thirdly, write it down, write it down. I'm getting ready to go see my friend next month and he wants to start a, a clean, uh, commercial cleaning business. And we talk about it all the time. I said, okay, all right, write it down. Show me where, how this, from your perspective, doesn't have to be 100% correct. Where do we start? He doesn't write it down. So it's, it's all up here, all up in his head. And I said, you know, your emotions can change. Your feelings can change. It's a biblical principle. You know, if you guys can see where I'm sitting right now in my office, I got posting notes all over my desk area of where, things that I'm working on, projects that I'm working on, because I'm looking at it every day every day. And the thing is, it's just like, you're going to make mistakes. That's no problem with mistakes, but mistakes are nothing more than learning opportunities. That's another thing that I learned. It's not that the fact that you, when I was a, 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 a Sergeant Major uh, in charge of a company and I told my soldiers, go out there, do your job. And they would say, Sergeant Major, what if I make a mistake? Make a good one, make a good one. Because the thing about it is, if you're going to make a mistake, if you're working for me and you make it, you made a mistake, I'm going to ask you, what was your intent? And you should be able to speak to that thing. What was your intent? And I won't, I, chances are nine times out of 10, I won't chew you out because you made a decision. And a lot of people are afraid about making decisions. You know, that stifles a lot of creativity and everything like that. But you got, you make a mistake, own it, learn, learn from it. When you go back, regroup, reevaluate and then take another step forward again and do it again. Cause that's what you get from me. I'm not going to feel sorry for you. I'm going to tell you, get out there and do it again. And again, and again, my son, uh, if I can say uh, in the book, 
my son got arrested while I was in Iraq. And I don't wish that on any family. You know, go see your child at the county jail. My son was in the county jail for 14 days. And uh, he was in the Army Reserve. He got home. He got a, He was uh, charged with, uh, he got hanging out the wrong crowd. Stolen vehicle, weapon in the car, drug paraphernalia, a couple of other things. So uh, long story short, he got acquitted. He didn't do any of that. He Luckily, he got off by the grace of God. He got off because he didn't do anything. He was just hanging with the wrong crowd. I was in Baghdad. I called back. I asked my wife, I said, how's he doing? My, my son's about, at this time, about 19, 20 years old. My wife says uh, he he won't go outside. He's kind of depressed. And you know when your children are really sorry. You know when they're really sorry. So I put him on the phone. And I said, put him on the phone. And I said, what's up, champ? He goes, uh, well, I made a mistake. And I, I missed, you know, I, I know the family, you know, I ruined the family. I said, hey, we all make mistakes, bro. We all make mistakes. And I said, what did I teach you? And he goes, well, you said that it doesn't matter if you make a mistake, but, you know, as long as you learn from it. I said, what's the rest of it? He said, well, you said, Dad, you said that if you make a mistake, people are going to wait and are watching to see what you do when you get up, when you get up, because we're all going to make mistakes. And people are looking at you to see what you're going to do if you're going to get up. Because if you don't get up, all your critics are going to say, I told you so. They're going to say, I told you so. But if you get up and take another step, they're, they're, nobody's going to remember all those mistakes. Nobody's going to remember all this stuff, all the failures and stuff. And I, I told, I was telling these kids, I said, all these people that you look at, LeBron, uh, Stephen Curry, um, all these wealthy people that are doing really well, these people are nothing more than disciplined learners. They just do the same thing over and over again, you know, and, and that's what you can do. We all have that capability to do that. So, basically get up and take another step get up you know and of course it's scary i get it i, I your your listeners are listening to this they're their business starting their business it's scary i admit it is scary you do it scared do you not scared anymore you know because when i was in iraq you know hey i heard them bombs and them wep the, the, the weapon systems go off every night i was terrified but i got up every day and i said lord give me the strength i have to get through this and i did Mm. Kind of a long answer, but, <laughs> but, you know, I get, I, I, I'm very passionate about that, you know, just seeing, um, you know, business owners, people just starting out, they have a dream. And that's one thing I'm really glad about the African-American culture. Now I, I wrote a letter to BET. I got mad. I said, Hey, you're not showing, you know, the African-American culture. We got so many great people that are doing great stuff out there. Why aren't you featuring these people? You know, instead I'm seeing rappers and athletes and singers because I know, hey, when I was in high school, I played basketball. I played football, but I knew I wasn't going to be in the NFL. I knew I wasn't going to be in the NBA. However, I did something well. So if, if you, if I tell you, Corey, if you know me long enough, I'm the type of guy that comes down and punch you in the chest and say, what do you do well? Because everybody does something well. And you capitalize on that because you can get paid for that. You can build a business out of that. And like I said earlier before, what a great opportunity to wake up and do what you love. Run your own business. And I, like I said, I'm older than you guys. When I saw a Black business owner, I, I didn't know what that was. I didn't know that was possible. So this is Kalali Dobe. I'm from, uh, I'm coming out of uh, Calvert County, Prince Frederick, Maryland. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, first of all, thanks for coming and spending some time with us. Um, everything you said was really heartfelt and I really felt, you know, the energy behind it, the positivity behind it. And you know, that you really speaking from the heart, yes, um, sir. uh, excuse me if this was, um, covered before, but I wanted to ask you, like, I, I heard you touch on, you know, have, you know, money being a tool, right. And money being, you know, uh, something, something that we should have a plan for. Could you, could you elaborate a little bit more on like how you, once you make the money, right. Mm -hmm. what you what you uh how you organize a plan for that money like so one idea that i've been you know contemplating on my own life is okay i'm making a little bit of money but every bit of money i make there should be a plan for where it goes it shouldn't just be like oh i got this money so now i'm gonna go like you said go buy pizza and beer or i'm gonna go buy 
<laughs> you know, or if I got a big amount of money, oh, I'm gonna go buy me a new car, or I'm gonna go yeah. do this other thing in my house without previously having plan ha it having been in some kind of plan. So, could you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's a great question. I I noticed when uh, I'll give you a real life story when my young soldiers. When I was a DI, I saw soldiers come in, and I'm talking about the minority soldiers. I seen soldiers come in; they got their first paycheck. It was the most amount of money they've ever seen in their life. Uh, some of these uh, soldiers were from Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, dirt poor, had all this money. And you're right; the first thing they do, they go out and buy motorcycles, they buy Nikes, they go. Out, and I said, "Hey, that's what poor people do." I said, "There's nothing wrong with having motorcycles. There's nothing wrong with having Nikes." But you got to think outside the box, because if you look at the and I'm not I, I won't touch on it, but the politics of our country, the way that the 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 rich guys or, or the, the government controls poor people is you give the illusion of giving them things. I'm going to give you something like and make you feel like you're a victim. You're not a victim. So when these soldiers get their first paycheck, I said, hey, did you instead of taking that entire paycheck? And spending it frivolous, frivolously on clothes and sneakers and designer clothes and all that. Have you ever thought about putting it in, in the Army savings plan? We have a savings plan in the military that for every $1 you put in, the military puts $8 in. So if you do three years, just three years in the military, you can walk out with $25,000 cash money in your pocket. On top of that, we have the college fund. At, while you're doing that, you can go to college. You're eligible for going to college and the military will pay for it. Because if you don't want to stay in the military and be a soldier, start preparing for your career. Are you going to go into law enforcement? Are you going to go into uh, start learning how taking business classes? Why pay for that on the outside? Let somebody pay for that for you. So you start learning how to run a business. You got to start thinking all these things. It's called be, being proactive. Instead of being reactive, you know, and you'd be surprised. It takes a while for a lot of these young kids to get hip to that because I understand what I, what I and I, I grew up poor, too. I understand, too. You know, when I first time I got a twenty dollar bill in my hand, I was like, mm -hmm. I had a heart attack. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to go get pizza and I'm, I'm going to get my, my sneakers. And I thought I had it made. But then after a while, I realized there's more to life than that. So I had to learn how to take that money and diversify put it into other things. So when I'm sleeping at night, I'm making money. Even right now, I I have a website. I, if you go to my website, I, I, I'm taking, uh, I, I book meetings and events while I'm sleeping, trying to earn money right there. So people invite me and pay me to be there. Yeah. I spent money on having web designers create my website so people can click into my business so I can make money. I don't. I have no programming degree. But I pay people to do that. I'll spend the extra five hundred bucks, a thousand bucks for people to develop my site, so I can. I have, you heard the term "spend money to make money." That's what I have to do. And I had to learn one word, and this is from, you know, I had to pray about it because I learned this growing up. I'd stop. I had to learn the word "cheap." Stop being cheap, because like, oh, uh, you know, and and I, I'm laughing at myself because I remember when. My, uh, my wife, I met my wife in college and we first time we went to a real restaurant and I remember sitting in the restaurant and I'm sweating. She said, what's wrong with you? I said, oh, oh we can't afford this. Oh, no. You know, we I, I, I'm just playing the playing the, the victim card. Oh, no, no, no. You know, and she said, give me a break. And then when I, I started going to more and more restaurants and this and that, I realized I could afford it. It's just that I was programmed that way. I was programmed that way to just take money and hide it. And now my dad, my dad passed away about six years ago, but I love the man. He's my hero. But my dad was tight. My dad could save money, but he would never spend money. And I used to joke with him. I said, you know, when we, whenever I'm the oldest of six children, I said, dad, we need some money. He'd go upstairs and mysteriously go to that sock drawer. And he had cash in that sock drawer. I told him, I said, when he, when he passed, I'm hitting that sock drawer. There's probably about 10 grand in that sock drawer. But see, I asked my mom about my dad, and she said, well, your dad grew up in the country in Alabama. When they, they had to save money, they had to, you know, he had to help with feeding, you know, take care of the family. And I get that. That's our history. But now, 
for us for us minorities. That's not our history anymore. That's where we came from. And I say this to you. I'm saying this to all of your listeners on this call. You may not have met great great granddaddy so and so. You may not have met great grandmama so and so. But however, all of us are sitting on this call because somebody survived. Somebody survived for you to be sitting in that chair, sir. And the way that you pay these people back, if I could be free, take the responsibility to speak for these people, the way you pay these people back is you go further. That's your job. So if, you know, you never met your grandparents or your ancestors from the 1800s or the early 1930s or 40s, if they were standing in front of you, they would say, boy, get after it, get after it. And I mean, now I've got six grandchildren and, I, and I've told them they range from 17 to three. I told them, I said, hey, you want to pay me back? Go further. Go yeah. further. Yeah, that's that's definitely real. I could tell you, you know, from experience, like, you know, um, I'm blessed to, you know, be in a yes, great. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. you are. In, in you a great have the talent. So somebody survived for you. They you owe that to them to go further. Yeah, yeah. No, I, what, I, and I'm, what I'm saying is I'm, I'm blessed to be in a, in a great position right now, you know, in my life. And, you yes, know, sir. I didn't um, like. When I was really young, this is even before I met, because me and Corey go way back, you know what I'm saying? But, but before, even before before I met Corey, you know, uh, you know, I, I live what we call working class, you know, working class, ad working class poverty adjacent, you know. What I'm <laughs> yeah, <I don't> <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, what you said really, really, you know, touched me in a way because it's so hard to get out of that. Like I did the same thing. Like you know, I met my wife, and she got, you know, she really understands the concept of make money you know spend money to make money you know what i'm right. saying but but for me it was always like nah i need to hold on to the money because i don't, i didn't have a whole lot when i was coming up you know yeah. what i'm saying at first you know what i'm saying so i was like i need to hold on to the money you know yeah. and so and that's why i was asking you that question because coming trying to come back around to it now it's like well wait a minute wait a minute is is i can't i can't sit here now and say there's not money coming in right mm -hmm. now so now it's like I need to find and, and what you said just hit so hard on what I was talking about is find ways to invest the money that brings a return on investment that's bigger than what I originally, you know, am making. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, and, and to add the caveat on that, okay, that there's a there's a there's a spirit now that's being broken right now where I love this show, what Corey's doing, where you got to remember, I, like I'm a lot older than you guys, but to see successful black men is important to me because I've seen successful black women. No problem. Seen that. Been there, done that. But to see a successful black man who's not playing, who doesn't have an NFL football contract, not playing for the NBA, doesn't have gold records, but has a viable business that he can stand up to and say that's his. He did that with his own ingenuity, his own thoughts, that my friend is a role model. That is something I point my kids to, my grandkids to, because uh, right now, like I said, I'm volunteering at a at a high school right now, and a lot of the, especially the young black men, gravitate to me because they're like, "Oh my gosh, you you know, you were Sergeant Major, you have your own business." They they've never seen that before, and that that grieves my spirit. That makes me so upset to the point where I'm at tears. Why is that? Why is that not? Why is that happening? And sometimes some of it is, yeah, uh, the history of our country, but it's getting better. It's getting better. It's going to take guys like you and Corey and all your listeners that are on this call to to move that forward. So I'm championing you guys to do that. I'm counting on you guys to do that. That's so important for our, for especially the young black men, because they don't see that. And again, like I said, trying to get you to see through their eyes. I don't want Snoop Dogg to be their hero. My son started laughing because I told him, I said, if I saw Snoop Dogg walk down the street, I would literally walk up and punch him in the nose. <laughs> no problem. And my son's like, why? I said, because you know what? I'm I grew up in the set, I grew up in the 70s, okay? I'm from New York. And I saw them cast like uh LL Cool J. I saw all those guys before they made it. You know, but I I try to tell you guys, I tell these kids, these guys are picking your pocket, man. I said, Snoop Dogg does not live in Compton, okay? He does not live in Compton. As a matter of fact, I've been to Compton. 
And Compton, actually, it's a nice place, to be honest with you. But Snoop does not live in Compton. He lives in a gated community. His kids go to the top-notch schools. And when you see all this on TV, it's an act. It's really an act. When you went, when you saw the Olympics this year and you saw Snoop at the Olympics, he wasn't there because of patriotism. I heard he got paid 50 grand to be there at the Olympics. So it's it's all the it's all image perception, you know? But you guys are the role models. You guys are the what we call in the military, boots on the ground. Our kids need to see that. Because I don't want young men coming up thinking like, well, the only way I can have a nice car and a nice house is if I got a have a multi-million dollar sports contract or or hit record. That's not true. That's not true at all. I really enjoy your passion. And I really, once again, really appreciate you spending some time with us on Black Men Sunday. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. My name is Ray Simmons. I'm calling from Brevard County in Rockledge, Florida. Uh, again, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for your service as well. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm loving everything that I'm hearing from you, sir. Uh, a lot, of, like you were just saying earlier, a lot of it depends on your will to go out and, and search, you know, for what you want. Um, and it's true, you know, even with my family, you know, I, I have to be the one to break that cycle, right? I wanted to see improvement. Yeah, I had to go get it. Nothing will fall into your laps. And that's hard to explain, you know, to like a, a lot of the younger generation right now, but nothing will just fall in your lap. You got to go out there and get it, you know, and you're going to fail. Right. And I, I, I tell my daughters um, and my five year old son, you know, I say fit, fail. And that's just the acronym for first attempt and mm -hmm. learning, you know, and I know you, you probably heard that same same thing yeah. before as well. And, and we we are the ones we have to be the examples and, and we have to go out there and we have to, you know, like you were saying, find something we're really good at and, and share that, you know, especially if you can share it with, you know, minorities or people mm -hmm. that look like us. Uh, you know, kids, same thing. So my one question for you, sir, is um, what, who are some of your inspirations? You know, I know some people, you know, strive to, you know, uh, my, my, my uh, uh, inspiration is this famous person, you know, and sometimes that fame, that sometimes the inspiration can be somebody local that you have, you know, maybe somebody in your family or friend, or, or like you were saying, somebody doing a career that, you know, you desire to do so who are some of your inspirations whether you know famous local or mm -hmm. uh yeah thanks Ed. that's a great that's a great question uh the first one i'm going to say is my dad uh, i write about him in the book broken things he got mad at me uh, i should have kind of cleared him with that before i wrote it in the book but but uh i wrote about him in my book and i i wrote that he he didn't finish high school he has a fifth grade education and he and my mom raised all six of us in New York. My dad came to New York uh, to be exact. Uh, there was a migration for a lot of the black families from the South to the North in the sixties for work. And my dad uh, came to, uh, to New York. Actually, they worked at West Point, the famous West Point Military Academy. And we were born there. And my dad being the oldest, I kind of had a front seat to his struggle. You know, he, I remember he was working two, maybe three jobs and he would come in. He was so tired. I remember him just eating, just barely staying awake to eat dinner, you know, with us and stuff. Uh, he was a very strict disciplinarian. Uh, like we go to church, we weren't allowed to wear clip on ties. This is how strict he is. He wanted us. I, I had to stay in my room until I learned how to tie a tie. But however, when I joined the military and we had to put on our dress uniform, I had to tie all the guys in my unit unit's ties and I made 50 bucks. So it always comes around full circle, right? But my dad was very strict disciplinary. He had to go to church. He wants you to be in school. Uh, he did not tolerate sass and back adults, um, any type of disobedience whatsoever. And I still, uh, still hear his voice. He's still one of my heroes. And then there's this lady, my 10th grade history teacher. And I always tell the story, Mrs. Ross, I was in the uh, 10th grade in high school and I, and this woman had a way of teaching history, American history. I, she just captivated me. I thought I was watching TV. So I was getting like straight A's and I was killing it. I'm just killing it. And I came in one day and she said, uh, Roy, 
I think you need to take honors history. You're, you're doing very well in my class. You need to take honors history. And I said, thank you, Mrs. Ross. I'm fine. I'm straight. I'm good right where I'm at. And she says, you're going to honors history. And to, I'm embarrassed. I went kicking and screaming to honors history. And I'm also equally embarrassed. I called that woman. She's a white woman. I called her every racist name in the book. I had a whole stack of race cards. And uh, praise God, she ignored, she ignored me. But I, I like to say I, I was taking one for the team. I was positive. No, I, I was screaming. I, I even went to my parents. My parents backed her up, and they made me go. Uh, long story short, I remember I took the exam. I ran to her office, and I never. It was like it was the other day. And I tell it, I tell it, and I even get emotional about it. I ran to her office. I said, "Mrs. Roth, I got a B plus. I got a B plus." And that woman, she stood there. She looked at me, tipped her glasses down. She said, "Very good, Roy," and she walked away. And brother, I stood there, and I had an epiphany. The light bulb came on, and I said, "This woman ignored all my gripes." all my complaints. I She didn't look like me. She didn't come from the same part of the town tracks that I came from, but she saw something in me to push me like that. And I swore right there on the spot. I was about 17. I said, I, I that's where I want to go. That Those are the kind of people I want to be around. And it was such a good feeling of this person took this little black kid and said, hey, you're going to do this. You you're You're able to do this. So I knew the difference and it kind of turned, it taught me the difference between criticism and constructive criticism. I knew the difference. And, and I said, I want to be around those type of people that make me better. So she was one of my heroes and she still is, you know, and, uh, and then eventually it's just a lot of other people, uh, my faith in Christ, Jesus Christ is one of my heroes and just uh, finding people I just find fascinating people that just take nothing and make something. I mean, people that are, that say, how I want to do this. And they just don't care about what their friends say. They're just so dialed in. Those are the kind of people that really uh, impress me because they, at, at that moment, they don't have the money. They don't have the resources. And then all of a sudden they stay with it. They stay with it. And then boom, it happens. And I think that's kind of one of the ingredients for success. Everybody here on this call, all the listeners, are you're capable of doing that. And like I said before, before earlier, people don't get you. They they don't get you. So stop looking for them to get you. You have to get you. You know, you have to wake up and say, I need to do this. I, I'll give you another story if I can kind of go into it. I got laid off. Uh, I was working for the bank. I got laid off three times in one year three times at the banks here in Charlotte. And I'm sitting there and I'm sitting in my desk chair and I'm kind of sulking like us men normally do. We kind of sulk, we don't cry, we sulk and hem and haw. And uh, my wife came up, uh, I had one of those little, you know, you get a happy meal for the kids and they had little, Burger King had them little crowns that they put in there, the kids little happy meal thing. I'm sitting there sulking and my wife came up behind me, put that crown on my head and I started laughing. I started cracking up laughing. And let me tell you something. I'm talking the way I am, but she gave it. She gave it to me. She said, how dare you sit there in that chair? You tell everybody that they can do this and you tell everybody they can do this and you're sitting back. Oh boy, she unloaded. She unloaded on me. And she's one of my heroes too. Cause she sat back there. She said, Hey, either you, you practice what you preach, either you believe it or you don't. And I got an earful that day. And I took it, I got back on that laptop, I landed a job in two weeks. I've never been without a job, you know? Never been without resources because I don't believe what the world tells me. I'm not a victim. I wake up every day, I can do anything I want. You know, a matter of fact, you guys can't see it, but I got a whiteboard underneath my desk here in my office. At the at every beginning of every year, I write down at least 50 things that I want to do. And at the end of the year, I check them off. Because remember I said earlier, write it down, write it down what you want to do, because I'm telling you, it will come to pass. It will come to pass. But yeah, I hope I answered your question. Those are my heroes, man. And I, I think about them daily, you know, and um, I just, uh, I'm I'm Roy Jr. And my dad, uh, I, I know he's proud of me, you know, and now I have a son myself. You got to be careful because God, that's how God pays you back. I got a, my son, God gives you a Xerox copy of yourself.
you get a Xerox copy yourself. Cause my son is just like me. He walks in a room, but he don't lack for a friend. But then again, he's got a son, my grandson. He is a Xerox copy of my son. Such a slickster, but uh, but he's he's bound. You know, we speak we speak life into him. We speak success into him. And I, we tell him, hey, go out there and get it. Go ahead, go go after it. Don't be a victim for anybody. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Roy, for answering that question. Yes, sir. Sergeant Roy Lewis, man, you enjoying yourself on Black Men Sundays? Sure. Put me up there, man. I I, I love this stuff. This is this is what I, and I'm going to point other brothers to this stuff because this is how we need to be talking. This is how we need to be talking. Because right now, you guys got goosebumps on my arm. I'm ready to go run outside and do some push-ups. <laughs> I hear that. You know, you, you know. You know, you you're a U.S. sergeant up, major. Man. You know, you're a sergeant major, man, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, man. Lead by example, man. You know, you lead, be prepared Be prepared to be tripped from behind, but I lead. <laughs> I got you. But let me ask you this, man. It's an election year. You know, I'm asking all our guests up until the election. Who are you voting for this year, man? I can answer that one way. And I thought about this. I was praying about it because I'm looking not so much at the candidates. I'm looking at how they want me to kind of take this information in. And I realized that they're they're doing a strategy here, and this is the strategy. If I can, if I can kind of humor your your listeners and everyone when I get asked this question, I said we're being presented with a package of like vote for this person versus this person, and then when you when they package it that way, they're trying to get you to look at their character and their personalities. And when I do that, I realize first of all. Having been a senior leader myself, nobody's perfect. There's bad blood on every side. There's faults on every side. Now, that takes you to a place where I'm looking at the values. And I take both parties and I line up their values. And I check them off and which one did I, as far as their values. Now, I will tell you, I'm voting red because I don't, I don't like the character of the people on that side. However, the values, I can stand by some of those, most of those values. On the blue side, I don't like some of the values that they're representing. Thanks for coming on Black Men Sundays. We enjoyed you. Definitely going to have to have you come back on, you know, because like I said, you know, we talk about the, the many layers of wealth building, finance, business, mental health. So you just added another layer to that. So thanks for coming on the show. Sergeant Roy Lewis, this brother here, man, drill instructor um sergeant major academy graduate 2017 thanks for coming on black men sundays brother and enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the rest of your week man absolutely you brothers you know thanks for inviting me you guys uh, keep on keeping on if you need some help get me on the celly i'll be there man all right cool yeah i'm thinking you know we're gonna probably get this debate going so <laughs> see see if see if you want some of that action <laughs> i want some of it man i hey i will take prisoners man i'll sit back here man you know <laughs> must take names. Yeah. Uh, the words of uh to quote the movie um major pain i love that movie cracks me up where he, damon way is say i'm gonna make you boys strong <laughs> 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 i love that part cracks me up <laughs> but sure no problem thank you for inviting me it's a black man sunday time to put on childish things